Hi, everyone. It's Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In this article, I want to look at the issue of variability of practice and prevention of injury. As I discussed back in episode number 324, when looking at kind of the ecological approach to in injury and recovery and adaptation to injury, one of the more interesting ideas that I think have come out recently is um, what's been called the variability over use hypothesis. And this is an idea first proposed by James. And this is the idea. So when we think about injury, the most common traditional way we think about why injuries are caused are two factors. You're doing too much, right? So too much load, too much weight, too throwing too hard, and you're doing it too often, right? Too many days in a row, too many sessions, too many reps. The variability overuse hypothesis proposes that there's a third variable that comes into play here, and it's doing too many repetitions, too low variability, right? So doing the same movement over and over again in the same way increases the chance of injury. And as I said, in, in that episode, I talk about some evidence for that where they show that training to increase your variability, for example, in your stride and running, actually seems to help prevent injury and help prevent pain. This is another study, a recent study that come, came out that's along these lines. So it's by Arangi and colleagues, a study published in Human Movement Science uh, this year. So in this study, the authors are looking at ACL injuries, right? And so what they start off with is describing you know, the fact that ACL injuries are very, very common in cutting sports that involve sidestep or cutting, like football, soccer, basketball, obviously. And... In these sports, there's been several kinematic and kinetic factors that have been identified that seem to be related to the, the likelihood of injury, right? So for example, the amount of angle of your knee, so knee flexion at the support of contact, at the point of contact, <clears throat> the amount of force on your knee angle and various angles, right? So the idea here, I'm not gonna go into depth in all of these, the idea here is that we can identify um, parts of a technique that seem to be related to injury, right? In terms of kinematics, uh, angles, and in terms of forces, right? So these are these things that can essentially serve as a proxy or a surrogate measure for the risk of injury, right? If you have these certain angles and these certain forces, it increases your risk of in getting injured. It's not a guarantee, but obviously there's, there's some relationship here that's been established through research. And I'll come back to this point uh, later on. In this study, the authors, again, are testing the question, can we reduce these risk factors by training with higher variability? And as I discussed in the, the, that previous episode, the basic idea is kind of outlined here. If you train under more variable conditions, right? So I'm jumping, if I'm doing a jump off a certain height, if I vary the height, vary the way you have to land, vary the way you have to cut, what I'm doing is forcing the performer to bring in more degrees of freedom into the solution, right? They're coming up with more adaptive solutions to perform the same thing, a cut. And the idea here is that when we do that, what we're, it's going to allow our body to do is distribute the forces more, more evenly. Instead of always doing the exact same movement where the forces are always occurring the same way, we can distribute them in, in different ways by pulling in more degrees of freedom in our movement. And so that's the general idea, that, that if we can do this, we can encourage you to be more adaptable, have more movement solutions through adding variability to practice, we can reduce your chance of injury. And of course, in this paper, the authors focus on two ways that we can add variability to practice that I've talked about a lot on the podcast. The constraints-led approach, which the authors in the paper call them the nonlinear pedagogy, um, and differential learning, right? So those are the two things they're gonna focus on in this paper. So just to clear, you know, uh, kind of identify the, the differences, right? So linear pedagogy, what they call in the paper, which I prefer to call prescriptive instruction, <clears throat> the idea here is we're going to train you to have one ideal movement pattern or technique, right? We're going to give you corrective feedback. We don't want a lot of variability in movement. We want one ideal movement, right? Variability is noise deviation. So very traditional view of uh, prescriptive coaching, right? So that's going to be one of the conditions in the study, and I'll come back back to that uh, later on. The other two conditions, the nonlinear condition, so there's going to be a nonlinear conditions, which is really a constraints-led approach, and differential learning. Both of these, of course, encourage variability in movement, um, as I've talked about many times on the podcast now, uh, 
um, as being good, right? Variability is needed to be able to adapt to different constraints in your environment. So adding variability in practice teaches you to be a movement problem solver. In the article, the authors do a really nice job of differentiating the CLA and, and differential learning, which I've tried to do in many different ways. You know, on my resource page, uh, on, on my perceptionaction.com, you can see the differences. They do it really nicely by talking about how variability is added. And this is really consistent with uh, what I've been saying, right? So in the CLA, the variability you add is quite structured, right? So you are trying to take away a particular movement solution by using a connection ball, by using a smaller racket, and push a person towards another uh, to explore other movement solutions. So they're very, very, your very uh, conditions are very purposeful of, of trying to get a certain movement pattern away from a certain movement pattern and destabilize a detractor. Going back to a recent episode I had on the podcast, which is the number 348, this is kind of colored, what we call colored noise. So it's noise that has a pattern to it. Whereas uh, in differential learning, um, what the no variability we're added is not as structured. It's more random, right? In terms of noise, it's white noise, right? Because we're not trying to destabilize a certain solution or push you in a certain direction or push you through a certain affordance. We're doing, you know, what I call, which uh, Wolfgang Schorhorn hates when I say this, variability for variability's sake, right? We were pushing you, we're telling you different body postures to, to adopt, different movements to do, to get you to explore the full range of possibilities, right? So it's much less structured and purposeful in the way that the CLA is, right? That's the way that I like to differentiate them. So in this study, they're going to compare those three things, prescriptive or linear, CLA or nonlinear, what they call, and differential learning. And what they, were, what they want to do is compare. They're going to train soccer players using these three different measures. They're going to do pre and post tests of these kinematic and kinetic factors, you know, knee angles, forces, et cetera, before and after to see how they change, right? And, of course, what they're hypothesizing is both the methods that encourage variability, which is the CLA and differential learning, are going to have positive outcomes in terms of these risk factors, right? So if an angle is supposed to be big, it's going to increase it. If an angle is supposed to be small, it's decrease it. If the force is supposed to be less, it will decrease it, right? The, as compared to linear prescriptive instruction, right? So that's what they were trying to test here. For this, they used 66 beginners um, in soccer. There was 22 players per condition. The reason they had that number was because they played some of the practice involved 11 on 11. They did pre and post tests that involved running five meters, then rapidly changing direction while you were being motion tracked with a camera <clears throat> and markers. And so they could measure the kinematics and the kinetics. Uh, they had force measure plates as well. Um, the, the interventions themselves, right? So the training interventions between those tests were, as I said, there were standard soccer practice focusing on soccer skills. So they weren't training cutting <laughs> or sidestepping, they were training soccer. They were training shooting, dribbling, et cetera, and so on. The um, different methods are, what was done in the different training methods uh, was uh, pretty standard to what you see. So these are this table kind of highlights it. So we have the linear prescriptive instruction, the nonlinear constraints-led approach, and the differential learning group, right? And for those people just listening, um, the main thing that we're seeing here is uh, you know, classic prescriptive instruction, not a lot of variability in practice, corrective, lots of repetition. In constraints led approach, we're, we're having semi-structured variability. So we're adding different constraints, right? Small sided games, having to use a different size ball, right? Having to pass in certain ways versus, uh, and the final one, um, differential learning is the standard one where you say, you know, pass with your hand, two hands behind your head. Uh, do this corner kick with your your foot stance wider than normal, that kind of thing. So very standard uh, approach to these these different techniques. And you, if you're interested, you could listen to the former the earlier episodes I've done on these two approaches. They're they're pretty uh, basic. So they had these three con training conditions, and then they measured the variables afterwards. The dependent variables they measured, as I said, were again from previous studies that have measured things that seem to be related to the risk of knee injuries. Um, for example, trunk flexion angle, hip angles, knee angles, um, then the vertical ground reaction forces, right? Obviously, you want less force um, in certain uh, impact. That less force is going to create less chance of an injury. So they measured a bunch of these different variables before and after. <clears throat> 
What they found was that for all the kinetic and kinematic variables, both the CLA and differential learning resulted in more positive outcomes than the linear prescriptive instruction, right? So in terms of angles, when an angle, for example, the, the knee flexion angle at cutting, you wanted that big, it was bigger in the, in the group that trained in the, the, the methods that encouraged variability. When you wanted forces to be uh, lower, they were lower, right, um, in the groups, right? So if you're watching, this one is the graph here is showing the, the angles. Um, this one is showing the forces. So the ground reaction forces were lowest. They actually decreased after training for the, the CLA group and the D differential learning group, whereas they actually went up for the linear prescriptive group, right? So all of these things seem to be suggesting that training with more variability is, is getting positive outcomes in terms of the risk factories, factors for ACL injury. In terms of the comparison between the two, uh, CLA and differential learning, the authors kind of found what I found in my previous research where, where there's more benefits to the CLA, right? As I said, uh, my, that's my preference, partly because I understand how to do it more. Um, but I think you know it's more purposeful, structured variability as opposed just to, just to more random fluctuations and white noise, right? So a lot of really good outcomes here. Um, and the authors conclude that they, the results seem to support their hypothesis, right? Um, train, adding more variability of practice, whether it's through the constraints that approach or a differential learning approach, seems to reduce the risk factors for, for injury to ACL. Um, it also, um, it, um, it seems, so it seems to be very effective. The CLA, if we have to pick one, seems to be the most effective, right? Um, what about some, and, and I should, what about uh, some limitations to this study? Well, overall, I think it was well designed, but I think, you know, if I was a critic of the ecological approach, and there's many out there, um, one of the things I was a uh, point to, and this is a very common thing that critics of ecological, these studies uh, point to, is that the, the linear prescriptive instruction group in this study was perhaps kind of a straw man in that, you know, saying that you're going to coach everyone to the exact same technique um, with no variation for individuals is pretty extreme, right? You do see that out there and I could show you some examples. It's still out there. I don't think it's a complete straw man, um, but you know, there is room for variability within prescriptive coaching, right? So uh, perhaps a better, you know, if we're going to follow up this study, a, a better comparison condition would be a prescriptive instruction condition. So we're giving people instructions about how to shoot pass, corn, do corner kicks, et cetera, but you're using random practice. So you could do two corner kicks, two passes, two shots, right? So the traditional way that um, variability is added to practice in a contextual interference idea, right? Which again, you can look at my resource page where I talk about that. So, so it is possible to have variability within prescriptive instruction. And that really that wasn't present here. So it's possible if you have variability within prescriptive instruction, it could also reduce these risk factors. So I think that's important to point out. The other thing, I don't think this is a huge problem, but I think it's worth noting is that there's some circular circularity here in that um, we're predefining the risk factor. And, you know, we're saying there's no perfect technique or we're allowing for variability, but then we're identifying these variables like angles and things that we don't want. And as I said, you know, I, I, I think when a, at a first glance, this might seem a counter don't, not to go together, right? We're saying there's a correct technique when there's not a correct technique. Um, but I, I think this is important to point out that saying that there's no one correct technique doesn't mean that there's not wrong ways to do it, right? There's not um, any ways that you can hurt yourself that we push your athlete away from it, right? Just saying there's not one correct technique, there can still be ways that are suboptimal or perhaps cause injuries that we want to move you away from. So overall, I think this is a really nice study. And I've actually added this study to my, so for those that don't know on my website, perceptionaction.com, uh, if you go to the page perceptionaction.com forward slash comparative, I'm keeping a running list of studies that make direct comparisons between some ecological approach that encourages variability, self-organization. So it's usually CLA or differential learning versus traditional prescriptive instruction. And there's now two, four, six, eight, nine studies in my list, right? 
that uh, have compared these kind of things. And what I'm doing is keeping track of the results, what kind of sport it was looking at. So this is yet another study that seems to show benefits to an ecological approach, right? So if people ask you for evidence for using an ecological approach like the CLA or DL, differential learning, you can go to this page, uh, perceptionaction.com forward slash comparative and say, look, here, here's a bunch of studies that provide some good support for it. Not all of them. There's a couple that uh, don't find any significant differences, but I think it, it's interesting to keep a tab on that. Okay, that's it for today's review. Um, thank you for joining me. And if you're interested in finding out more and supporting the podcast or getting bonus uh, content, please check out patreon.com forward slash perception action. Thank you and cheers for now.